I'm very pleased to have this, uh, this fellowship. Um, I just got off my sabbatical and I hadn't quite completed the work that I was hoping to complete during that period of time. And the fellowship gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, this is um, what I completed. This is a monograph. And uh, uh, it's called Moral Philosophy, a Theoretical and Practical Approach to Moral Decision Making. And um, I'm using this in three different classes that I teach right now. I, I use it for uh, a couple sections for my ethics and values class, a couple sections, well, several, uh, probably four sections for my uh, moral philosophy class, and about four sections for uh, my biomedical ethics class. And uh, it's working so far pretty well. And what I'd like to do today is I'd like to read a short paper. It's about 20 minutes long. Philosophers have a tendency to read papers because we try to keep it as tight and as concise as possible. But then afterwards, I'm going to show a, a very short four-minute um, video in which um, th there's no sound to it, but I'll be point pointing some things out and a few slides, and then we'll have a, a taste testing over here uh, afterwards. Um, this paper here is Democracy in the Honeybee Hive. And this is an example of what you can do after reading the first chapter of this text here. So after this text, a student should be able to um, evaluate a particular subject matter, and each one of these points basically comes out of that chapter. Okay? Honey bee hives are composed of individual bees that are, through the mutual cooperation and division of labor, function effectively as a superorganism. Beehive social organization has nothing related with human democratic decision making, yet it has become popular to talk about bee democracy. This book here, entitled Honey Bee Democracy, is by Seeley from um, Cornell, and he's probably one of the top entomologists in the world who's writing about um, bees right now, and um, um, He's talking about honeybee democracy, so it's very popular. Democracy is usually associated with an authoritarian, centralized government in which an informed citizenry and or representatives engage in adversarial debate. Beehives function without a centralized government, without an informed citizenry, and without adversarial debate. And although there is nothing that honeybees can learn from us, there is plenty that we as social beings can learn from honeybees. This is a quote from Peter Kropotkin. He did most of his research in Siberia. He's an anarchist, but um, uh, interesting perspective here. Uh, this is a quote from him. In all of these scenes of animal life which crossed before my eyes, I saw mutual aid and mutual support carried on to an extent which made me suspect in it a feature of the greatest importance for the maintenance of life, the preservation of each species and its further evolution. End quote. Nature through the process of natural selection has been honing the stimulus response mechanism of both the individual honeybee and the honeybee colony as a whole to such a degree of accuracy that it has now rivaled some of the best rational approaches of contemporary decision making, especially those decisions that are classified as democratic. However, it is becoming popular in some circles to refer to honeybee colony behavior as bee democracy. And this label is an unfortunate anthropocentric misnomer. Honeybee democracy is a misnomer, much like the Big Bang is a misnomer, caused by misunderstanding of the process of evolution. With regards to the Big Bang, the beginning of the cosmos was neither big, as the universe arose from an infinitesimal point, nor was there a bang, as there existed no medium for sound, nor was there any perceiving beings to experience a bang. Bee democracy is likewise a misnomer, caused by both a misunderstanding of the process of natural selection, as it relates to bees, progeny of genetic traits, and also a misunderstanding as it relates to the progeny of cultural means, or more specifically, development of linguistic signals that promote effective bee cooperation. It is true that honeybee colonies do not have an informed central ruling administration, nor an informed monarchical figure such as a queen or a king. However, that fact in no way means that honeybee colony must therefore be a democracy. The queen bee is another misnomer created from the anthropocentric concept of a centralized authority. Although it is true that the queen bee is the mother of all the brood in the nest, 
And all, although she uses her pheromones to keep the hive together and to signal the workers to not make any new queen cells, she's not a central organizer, has no authority on the daily workings of the colony, and has no knowledge of the activities that are going on around her that are necessary for the hive to function as a superorganism. Usually when addressing the issue of democracy and or decision-making, there's assumption of information exchange, comparison, and choice. For bees, there is evidence that there is some very rudimentary information exchange, but there is no evidence that bees are able to respond to stimuli in any other way than a cause-effect deterministic manner. Therefore, if democratic decision-making is based on a non-deterministic information exchange, and if bee information exchange turns out to be mechanistically determined, then the criteria of democracy and decision-making would not be met, and the term bee democracy or bee decision-making would be a misnomer at best and a fundamental misunderstanding at worst. <clears throat> Since a necessary condition for democracy and decision-making is knowledge acquisition, it is imperative to take a closer look at how honeybees acquire knowledge. Honeybees can be considered to have two types of information gathering means, passive cues and active cues. Passive cues are subtle environmental stimuli that result in adaptive responses by the perceiving bees. Environmental cues can provide either excitatory feedback, such as an excellent nectar source, or inhibitory feedback, such as too long a time to find a nectar receiver at the hive entrance. The pressures of natural selection cause the perceiving bees to adapt their responses to the passive environmental cues in such a way that the bees' responses are more advantageous than disadvantageous to the reproductive interest of the colony. Active signals are information-bearing actions that involve the adaptive modification of both the stimulus, signal, and the response, receiver. Bees have limited communicative skills, three of them being the waggle dance, informs location, the tremble dance, recruits nurse bees to become nectar storage bees, and the shaking, recruits non-foragers to become foraging bees. Natural selection of communicative signals generally occurs when environmental cues are not able to adequately or effectively convey necessary information creating natural selection pressures for the development of active communication signals. Active communication signals are difficult to develop because they require the development of both the signal stimulus, cause, and the proper response, effect, of the perceiver. In contrast, passive cues cannot be defined as communicative language, in that cues are passive in merely environmental states of affairs. Active signals clearly are a type of communicative language in that signals have both well-developed causal stimuli and well-developed subjective effects caused by the stimuli. Since democratic decision-making is a social affair that requires information exchange, it therefore appears that language is a necessary condition for democratic decision-making. There are several different language perspectives that can be adopted, four of which are language as sense datum, language as thought, language as any subjective experience, and language as pluralistic frameworks. Okay, so let's take a look at each one of these. Language as sense data. If language signals are defined as being a type of sense data, then they do not directly communicate the idea, rather they represent the idea in a form that may have little of any resemblance at all to the idea. For example, in the waggle dance, the number of waggles represents the amount of energy output necessary for the bee to get to a particular location, i.e. distance. So in terms of the waggle dance, if it happens that the wind picks up and the bees are traveling against the wind, they might miscalculate the actual distance because the waggle dance doesn't communicate exactly distance. It communicates the energy required to get to that particular location. If so, the waggle signal itself, number of waggles, is only a representation that has little if any resemblance at all to the idea of being commu communicated, distance based on energy output. Then the question arises as to whether or not the interpretation and or response of the perceiver to the signal is determined. Mechanistic determination of sense data is exemplified in the experience of, say, green grass. 
in which the perceiver has no voluntary input as to the experience caused by the wavelengths of light that stimulates the rods and cones in the eyes that create nerve impulses that stimulates the brain resulting in the subjective experience of green that only exists in the mind of the experiencer, i.e. greenness, is an experience that is independent of sense data causation. This experience is determined as made evidence by the simple fact that perceivers of green grass cannot voluntarily choose to experience the grass as, say, red. Therefore, it can be concluded that the experience of the quality of green is determined experience for the perceiver that has little, if any, resemblance at all to the light wavelengths of 53,000 angstroms that is the causation of the subjective experience of green. If the waggle signal is as such, then the waggle represents information which then stimulates the perceiving being into having a particular experience resulting in a particular response. If this perspective of B language is correct, then it would not support the notion of democracy or critical decision making because the responses are deterministically fixed and therefore no choices are being made. Language is thought. Another perspective on language would be considered that language signals are language signals as being the very thought or idea itself. However, the consequence of such a language perspective would be the conclusion that without language signals, there would, be, there would therefore be no thoughts or ideas, and without thoughts or ideas, there would be no language signals, as they are one and the same. In other words, is the concept of democracy dependent on the language symbols and concepts? Is it possible to have a thought of democracy without a language framework. The human perspective of democracy and decision-making seems to be very dependent on language framework of a centralized constitutional government with individual rights and liberties defined. One benefit of such a viewpoint is that the transferring of the subjective thought would be direct for those who share the same verbal language framework as there would be no intermediary transformation such as, for example, sense data. It would also follow that the types of thoughts that are possible would be directly related to the complexity of the language framework used. Simple language frameworks would generally result in simple thoughts. And more complex language frameworks would have the potential of more complex thoughts. An example is the language of mathematics in which the proportion to the mastery of mathematical axioms, postulates, and proofs, there results a potential for a greater number of types of complexities of mathematical expressions. Bees, in contrast, have such a rudimentary or limited set of symbolic language, for example, waggle, tremble, and shake, that it is inconceivable to even think that those symbols would meet the necessary conditions for the development of the cognitive concepts necessary for democratic decision-making. Language as any subjective experience. If the notion of language were to be expanded to include all knowledge gained by the experiences of perceiving beings, for example, symbols and cues, then language would be defined as any subjective experience. This definition of language would be either meaningless or at least tautological, as all that can be known by definition is already a cognitive experience, and language would therefore not provide any type of synthetic additive knowledge or communicative activity to the subjective experience. If language is a purely subjective cognitive experience, then language would no longer be a means of explaining how one subjective cognitive experiencer is able to communicate to another subjective cognitive uh, experiencer, which is a necessary condition for the concept of be democracy and decision making. Language as pluralistic frameworks. Clearly, language is pluralistic in its form and function. For example, the waggle dance is useful in communicating distance and direction. The tremble dance is useful in recruiting storagers. And shaking helps recruit foragers. However, like the game of charades in which the body language framework attempts to communicate a verbal language framework, it is many times difficult if not impossible to use one language framework to communicate a thought or event that can only be communicated using a different language framework. For example, it would be impossible for a bee to use a tremble dance to communicate what the waggle dance communicates. The problem that arises is that if human democracy and decision-making depends on certain types of language frameworks, and if bees do not have those language frameworks, 
then it is unreasonable to conclude that bees are democratic decision makers from a human linguistic point of view. Honeybees are cooperative, not adversarial. Democracies are generally understood to be adversarial and competitive, requiring an informed, authoritative, centralized government and a rational and informed citizenry. Honeybees, in contrast, are cooperative, not adversarial. And the social organizations are based on a complex of individual responses, not based on any type of authority or centralized government. Honeybees appear to be neither rational nor informed in terms of having a plurality of options. Rather, their actions are determined by very sophisticated and effective stimulus response mechanisms. Since democratic decision making is founded on an adversarial centralized authoritative government with an informed and rational citizenry, and since beehives are cooperative in nature, not adversarial, and since beehives do not have a centralized authoritative government, Rather, beehives are decentralized in structure, and since bees are not informed as to the states and conditions of the other individual bees or beehive as a whole, it therefore follows that beehives do not operate anything like a human democracy. Lastly, it is true that academics have significant epistemological limits as to what it can metaphysically establish. First of all, Empirical evidence can only evaluate the evidence for that which does exist, as empirical evidence for that which does not exist would obviously not exist. In other words, just as it is impossible to empirically prove the non-existence of something, such as Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, it is likewise empirically impossible to prove that honeybees do not make democratic decisions. However, what can be empirically established that the action of the honeybees can be best explained and understood as being determined by cooperative stimulus response mechanism instead of being based on an adversarial democratic process. Currently, there's no empirical evidence that even remotely supports that bees experience democratic decision making, let alone inform acquisition that is necessary condition for a centralized democratic adversarial debate. Secondly, statements of facts can never derive statements of ought as that would be to commit the naturalistic fallacy. In other words, empirical facts can never establish purpose, ends, or any other type of moral claims. Such teleological and or deontological claims are subjective determinations of experience, not empirical claims of fact. Lastly, it must also be recognized that all of reality has evolved into existence regardless of whether or not the subject is planetary systems, biological beings, or rational and moral principles. B democracy is clearly an anthropocentric misnomer that must be eliminated if entomology is to continue to progress in its analysis and understanding of honeybee behavior. Lessons to be learned. A beehive is a splendidly sophisticated superorganism with individual bees deterministically responding to various stimuli all the while behaving as a single cooperative organism. The lessons to be learned is not how honeybees function as democratic decision makers, as they do not. Rather, the lessons to be learned is how human democratic decision making can be improved by becoming less adversarial and authoritatively centralized and becoming more decentralized and cooperative, i.e. becoming more bee-like. A superorganism that has evolved from individual solitary parts into a mutually cooperative organism, resulting in the maximization of overall social and individual benefits and the minimization of burdens in a just and fair society. Democracy in the honeybee. I'd like to end with a quote from Peter Popotkin, uh, Kropotkin again. In the practice of mutual aid, which we can retrace to the earliest beginnings of evolution, we thus find the position and undoubted origin of our ethical conceptions. And we can affirm that in the ethical progress of man, mutual support, not mutual struggle, has had the leading part. In its wide extension, even at the present time, we also see the best guarantee of a still loftier evolution of our race. Okay, so that's the paper. And now I'd like to um, show you um, a short four-minute clip 
of putting in a nuke. A nuke is not a... <laughs> a nuke sounds kind of bad in our society, doesn't it? Um, uh, a nuke is a, um, uh, uh, about four pounds of bees. And uh, uh, it's about 15,000 bees. And I'll show you how it's done. Okay. So here I'm spraying um, uh, a honey, uh, honey solution on the bees. Gets them good and sticky. Gets them filled up. Makes them happy. This can here is filled with sugar water during transportation. That's the tab for the uh, queen bee. So the queen bee is going to have all these little, has she's emitting pheromones. Nurse bees are there feeding her. She can't feed herself. Comes in a, a, a little container like that to protect her. Takes about three days for the bees to get used to her because they haven't. Been, these are different queens than what the um, the bees have actually been um, uh, uh, been raised in. Okay, so I just stick it in my pocket. I'm wearing the same shirt as I'm wearing today. This is my bee-proof sh shirt. If you notice, I, there's no gloves necessary, no gear. They're in, a very, uh, they're in a very cooperative situation here. They don't have a home. They're looking for a home. And uh, I'm building them the Taj Mahal. There's nothing to be afraid of. They don't sting. Most bee stings that you get, that you experience, are from wasps, not from honeybees. Honeybees have only an interest of, of, um, of flowers. They don't bother you when you're eating ice cream cones or barbecuing or anything. This is a top bar high, so it's just empty. You'll see these slats a little bit earlier. So you just shake them. It's amazing. I've never done this in my life. This is st um, the reason why I'm so confident is because I understand stimulus response. In other words, I read. And um, uh, uh, they aren't uh, uh, just based on the conditions and the environment that they're in. They're not stimulated to sting or to protect. You know, they'll be landing all over you. It's wonderful. You'll see them putting up their tails and stuff. They're um, actually putting out a scent for the others to come. These are called top bars. Actually, this hive is upside down right now. See, I'm sticking my hand right in there. Oops. It's, I mean, it's just... This is my first time doing it, by the way. I've never done this before in my life, and you just go in there. It's interesting, I talked to other uh, beekeepers, and they thought I was absolutely crazy for doing this. So you should never do that without gear. But why? Bees and human beings have been around for as long as recorded history of mankind. And they've been working in a, um, in a reciprocal relationship. I provide a home for them. They provide extra honey, more than enough than what they need to survive for the winter. And so I get my little uh, payback as well. I got 50 pounds this year out of two hives, which incidentally we'll be tasting in a little bit here. All, all my hives, I don't use any type of sprays, chemicals, or anything, which most beehive keepers use tons of for mites and all that kind of stuff. There's no need for this, for this style that a beehive I have. Um, the honey has never been any warmer than 98 degrees, which is the temperature they keep the hive constantly. These are my girls. These are my working girls. She's my favorite. Um, all, all, all the workers are females, much like in our society. There's what my hive looks like. I have so many bees that they can't even stain, there's not enough room inside them. So this, this particular hive probably has 80,000 bees. My bee-proof shirt. Okay, a few other pictures here. Okay, once again, that's the can. That's the feeder, the nuke, the queen, queen bee. And please, um, right now, this is the time to start asking questions, if you would like to start asking questions on anything that um, we've seen so far. And then we'll talk about the paper in a few minutes. 
That's a queen bee there, shaking it in. So if, if the queen was not in that protective uh, container, would the other bees, because she is a foreign uh, mm -hmm. uh, destroyer? Well, pro um, the question is, what would happen if the bee was not in this, the queen bee was not in this container? And uh, 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 what would happen is, there's a couple of possibilities. Number, we, well, number one, the bees could get so excited that the queen gets what's called bald. And what that means is they just kind of get around it, hover it, and then the temperature will rise to such a degree that uh, the, um, the, the queen will die. Okay. So um, they are used to a different pheromone. So it takes about three days for them to uh, get used to the bees, uh, the new queen bee's pheromone. And so this is what's called a sugar plug. And this sugar plug, it will take about three days for the bees to eat through it. So they'll go in there and release her. In the meantime, the, the nurse bees will feed her through this, um, uh, uh, through this screen. She cannot feed herself. And um, uh, uh, in that period of time that it takes to get her uh, out, um, they'll be um, uh, used to her scent. Thank you. There's some comb. This is a top bar. By the way, the bees uh, work in a metric system. We're the only place in the world, I think, that still uses a non-metric system. This is a 24 millimeters across here, 12 millimeters here, for a total distance between is 36 millimeters. And what that will create, that will create a, a, a perfect bee space that you'll see. If you notice, there's a perfect circle all around here. This is all naturally built. And then across each way. And then what they do is they just kind of tag it with a little wax here. But it's totally open. It's amazing. Amazing engineers. There's some newly formed. You see how white the comb is? This is one that's full. Imagine all that. I mean, it's so heavy that um, I have a difficult time lifting one of these things myself. Okay, that's how heavy it is. Once again, take a look at the bee space. That's what fascinates me more than anything. That's what you need to consider when, be, when building a hive. They can be all different types of shapes and forms, but if you're trying to get to be the most effective, then the, um, uh, uh, you need to take that in consideration. These are 16-sided. I made these out of 2 by 4s This, this is 11.25 degree angle on each one of these cut. <laughs> Table saw does it pretty quick. And uh, very cheap to make. Here's one in which I didn't have a starter strip. A starter strip is on the top of the, uh, in fact, this is probably, this is pretty close to about the width of a top bar. And then what I would do is I would put a, a strip of wax, beeswax, right through here. And this one here, I got really crooked and I didn't do a very good job. Actually, I don't even know if I put one in here. So it ended up getting a little bit crooked, but um, um, that's interesting. Um, this is a much more, um, friendly type of, of beehive because it's not square, it's circular. Circular much like they'll find in nature when they, you know, flying, you know, in trees and so forth. And when they, 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 um, um, they, um, they ball up in the wintertime, and they start at the bottom of the hive, and they eat their way up. And they keep the hive fairly warm, okay? Like I said, it's almost, I think they keep it about 85 degrees, even, even in the wintertime. And the corners are extra space to heat up. Since they're circular, you know, they're like in balls, uh, this makes it more efficient so they don't have to heat up too much uh, uh, hive and uh, most effective uh, design. It's also why I made out of two by fours, a little extra insulation. There's a picture of one of my hives. They're quite beautiful, I think. I think there's another picture, let's see. Here's one. Here's what they look like. I don't paint them, and I don't put any type of oil or preservatives on the side, because if you notice, they live a good part of their lives on the outside of the hive too at night, because there's too many of them. These are my Italians. I have Cornelians and Italians, and my Italians just reproduce like mad. Uh, my other hive is a little bit more sensitive to the environment and will decrease its population depending upon the nectar flow. But this one here, as you can tell, um, that's just all by one queen. One queen. These are just eggs. And uh, this is called a warry high style. 
Um, I probably will have to, if you notice, we got a lot of rain this spring. And so because I didn't put any treatment on the roof, got a little bit of warpage and so forth. Might have to work with that, redo that. But um, the rest of it, I'm very pleased with it in that um, I'm glad I didn't uh, do any type of painting with any type of antifungi or any type of linseed oil or anything like that because um, uh, it gives a nice environment for the bees to live. Okay, so um, I gave a paper um, on, on bee democracy. This is something that my students in my classes should be able to do after doing chapter one of um, my manuscript that I put together. Okay. Um, is there any questions with regards to bee democracy? Yes. Do you, is there? Oh, okay. microphone. You talk about cooperation within the hive. Is there, do you see a level of cooperation between hives or, or are hives themselves between hives more adversarial? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, one of the things I did, and it might have been the reason why these two particular hives are so incredibly successful, much more so than they're supposed to be. In other words, you're not supposed to have any type of production like I'm having with the hives. Beekeepers around saying the first, uh, the first um, uh, year you should never be able to uh, uh, harvest any type of honey, but I have so much of it. And one of the things I did, I put two hives this, a, a distance this far apart from each other, both facing each other. And there, that just gets them a little bit excited because they see a lot of activity going on. So when they see other activity of another hive going, that kind of gets you kind of going, right? And so there's a little bit of that going on. So that can happen. And the Italians are known for, um, uh, like for example, if, you, if, if there's a particularly weak hive and if you happen to drop some honeycomb or something like that outside the hive, you can start a robbing type of uh, scenario. In other words, uh, they'll take advantage of easy sources of honey or nectar as best they can, all for the purpose of survival. But very much uh, cooperative. And they're even cooperative with me. The only time I ever got stung was when I was absolutely stupid. Okay, like for example, one time, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a newbie. Um, I, had every, I, I have this lift that I've created, and it lifts the whole hive up. I can lift up different sections. So I'm dressed much like I am today. I have this little um, uh, scraper. I'm looking inside, and I'm playing around with, there's all these bees hanging, and I'm, I'm knocking the bees down, they're falling on me, and then one got kind of irritated at what I was doing, because uh, I was trying to check out the comb and so forth, and it came and stung me in the hand. But I deserved it, didn't I? I mean, that, that, that was just stupidity, okay? And so I'm learning, and the only times I have ever been um, uh, uh, stung was um, from my own stupidity. Now, it is true that now it's fall. Now they have a hive. They have an established home. And it's very important for them to have enough reserves for the winter. So I do wear a bee suit now in the spring, I mean, in, in, in the fall. Okay, but whenever you have uh, swarming, which is, what is how they reproduce, swarms are really cool. I got a few, I've already um, uh, uh, got a few catchers that I've um, already put together and so forth. And I hope that in the spring I'll catch some, uh, some swarms and that's how they reproduce. And that's when they're really docile, like, like you saw earlier. So that would be kind of like swarm mentality. I got a question for you, if there's... Um, are all forms of democracy adversarial? One of the tenets that I made in the paper was democracy is a centralized government and adversarial. And I'm arguing that bees are not adversarial within their own community, and therefore um, uh, are not, in, that, in a sense, democratic. Do you think that there's um, forms of democracy that could be non-adversarial, and what would that be? Anybody? See, I feel like a teacher now. Well, Rawls might present one, John Rawls. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, com <coughs> communism. Uh, the former East Germany called themselves the Democratic Republic of Germany, and uh, it was a communist communal. Mm -hmm. Presumably, uh, that form of 
democracy would not be adversarial, uh, but more um, a super super organism, uh, the commune, mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. communism. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Also, John Rawls, you could, you could put together, for example, an ideal form of government uh, democracy in which we might have a non-adversarial um, form of debate and um, exchange of information. Currently, we're not anything near that, are we, here in the United States? And we generally think of the United States as being the supreme exemplar of democracy across the you know, all over the world, at least that's what many of us have a, a perspective of. But yet we see that, um, I wonder, I wonder to what extent our, our, our tendency to go to war and things like that is oftentimes um, uh, could be stemmed in terms of how we live our lives in such an adversarial fashion politically. And, um, uh, you know, healthy competitiveness is good, right? Yet on the other hand, I wonder to what extent adversarialness can, um, can go awry and start creating harm in terms of how we perceive others and so forth other societies, pluralistic societies that have different types of worldviews. Yes, Michael. I'm inclined to think that um, democracy may always have adversarial elements, but it doesn't seem to me we talk about a democracy unless we have at least a belief in some kind of cooperative possibilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a collective arrangement. It's not a war of one against one against one against one. Uh, the hope of democracy is that we have a basis for cooperation despite our adversarial tendencies. Um, so I, I, I find it hard to think of a democracy that is totally non-adversarial or one that is totally adversarial. I'm not even going to comment on that. I just think that's a great statement. And I just agree with you. I agree with you. And um, uh, that would be something that we could strive towards. And, I, you know, I think that we try to create frameworks of government that promotes that. Um, I wonder why and I wonder what we can do in terms of uh, learning from bee, bees cooperation, beehives and so forth. In other words, what are the lessons that we could learn in terms of having a more functional democracy? instead of dysfunctional democracy. So Dr. Pritchard, thank you, that was a good comment. Um, what I have over here is um, I have some honey. And this is raw honey, very tasty, uh, never been treated, fairly organic. I can't control where my bees fly and where they go, but generally uh, when you're not using uh, monocrop pasture lands for your your um, uh, honey source, your nectar source, which might be incredibly contaminated with uh, herbicides, pesticides, and other types of sides.